Hello and welcome to Curious Live. I'm your host, Rachel Funnell, and for this talk, I'm joined by journalist and Pulitzer Prize finalist, Annie Jacobson. Now, as a New York Times bestselling author, Annie's written lots of books, including Area 51 and Operation Paperclip, but it's her most recent book, Nuclear War, A Scenario, that brings us here today, as we're going to be discussing the reality of nuclear war and what it would mean if such a weapon were to go off in the present day. So, Annie, it's great to have you here. Thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. And this book, it goes into a staggering amount of detail for a scenario involving nuclear war. And when I was reading it, I couldn't help but think that as a journalist, you're very used to diving into topics. But as a resident of Earth, this stuff is tricky. We're facing not just our own mortality, but the end of civilization as we know it. So what was it that drew you to want to investigate this? So as an investigative reporter, I have written previously six books on military and intelligence programs. The CIA, the Pentagon, DARPA, all of them have been designed to prevent or deter nuclear World War III. I mean, countless of my sources have told me that, you know, men now in their 80s and 90s who were sort of cold warriors um, keeping back this apocalypse from happening. And the idea for a while was that they had succeeded. And we are in an entirely new territory, certainly what it feels like. And so I wanted to know from the upper echelons of the national security world here in America, what would happen if deterrence failed? And I was just as shocked learning what I learned as I was reporting the book as it sounds you were reading it. The example that it focuses on is of a one megaton thermonuclear bomb being dropped on Washington. So why was it that you wanted to look into that scenario specifically? Unfortunately, it's the most plausible scenario, or rather one of the most plausible scenarios. You know, you have these famous quotes from the early days of the nuclear race in the sort of 60s, when you have everyone from the President of the United States to the historians talking about how the big fear of the next war would be by some madman with pushing a button. Of course, that's a metaphor, but it's very close to reality. It's called a bolt out of the blue attack. And it very specifically means a large, unwarned attack that comes at the United States. And of course, in all the military scenarios, I learned that the top target is always the U.S. Pentagon. A one megaton thermonuclear bomb would take out the city. And as I show in the scenario, it then sets off almost certainly a series of, you know, you want to say unforeseen events. But as again, as I learned from talking to these national security people who have spent their lives dealing with these kind of hypothetical scenarios, almost certainly this chain of events gets set off uh, that has shown to be problematic time and time again. It is meant to be a wake-up call that people must pay attention to this kind of radical threat because right now we have world leaders actually talking about the possibility of using a tactical nuclear weapon. Yeah, it's really shocking and it feels very timely. What are the systems in place that mean that we, we almost certainly wouldn't just see one weapon, it would be, as you say, a flurry? The short version goes like this because the United States has profound and advanced technology, right? We have a satellite system in space called the SIBRS satellite system. It stands for Space Based Infrared Satellite System, right? And you uh, you can kind of nerd out on all of these details in my book. I footnote a lot of it. People can learn more where they want to. But that system is kind of like the 21st century Paul Revere. It's like, you know, the British are coming, except for in this scenario, it's the North Koreans are coming. They're not on horseback. They're coming with a nuclear-armed ICBM. And the first shocking detail, I think, of this scenario is that the United States Defense Department knows about that launch less than a second after launch. In other words, in a fraction of a sec second, this space satellite system can see the hot rocket exhaust 
on the launch pad. And there begins a series of events that are stunning, mostly because of the time frame involved. An ICBM, that's an intercontinental ballistic missile, with a nuclear weapon in its nose cone, takes approximately 30 minutes to get from any launch pad anywhere in the world to the continental United States. The second most powerful initial concept is something that the United States government has as policy. Again, almost certainly unknown by mo most people. It's called launch on warning. And it's exactly like it sounds. The United States doesn't wait to absorb a nuclear blow. They launch nuclear weapons in a counterstrike before the bomb strikes the United States. And that's why this ticking clock scenario is totally insane. One thing that really stuck with me was, uh, you were mentioned quite early on, that the weapons we saw dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima are pretty tiny compared to what we're dealing with now. So what kind of weapons are in the modern day nuclear arsenal and how have they changed since then? In the 1960s, this was talked about and perhaps even understood more thoroughly. But of course, in the day in which we live, people have literally forgotten. That's incredibly dangerous, I learned. So to answer your question about a thermonuclear bomb, um, for the book, I interviewed Richard Garwin, who is now 93. And shocking as it may seem, he drew the plans, the architectural plans, for the very first thermonuclear weapon that was exploded in 1952 in the Marshall Islands in a test. A thermonuclear weapon is so powerful, it has an atomic bomb, like the one dropped on Hiroshima or Nagasaki, inside itself that acts as the fuse for the bomb. And so the bomb that Garwin drew, uh, it was codenamed Ivy Mike, that exploded with 10.4 megatons of power. That is roughly 1,000 Hiroshima's exploding all at once in a single point detonation. Consider that kind of damage when you think about Hiroshima killing tens of thousands of people in an instant and tens of thousands more in the fire, in the blast, and in the horrific radiation poisoning that happens. You mentioned that, you know, these weapons, it's, it's so hard to fathom what it would look like. But for that scenario of the, the one megaton thermonuclear bomb hitting Washington, what would we be looking at after that thing has gone off? The center of the thermonuclear weapon is 180 million degrees. That's a temperature that's unfathomable, right? They say nuclear war is an un nuclear war is unimaginable. Well, no, it's not because I show you in the book. But there are some things that are impossible to imagine, and that temperature is one of them. So the entire fireball, everything within it, is utterly eviscerated. It is obliterated. It doesn't exist anymore. All cellular life gone. And there are situations with the radiation that emits from it, the x-ray light, that will blind people 10, 20, 30 miles away um, that are looking in the direction of the bomb. People's, you know, the wind degree, the, the amount of wind that comes out of the blast is also shocking. A hurricane is about 80 miles per hour. You're talking about several hundred mile an hour winds. The effects that I'm telling you are all sourced from Defense Department manuals because scientists have spent decades precisely calculating exactly what would happen. For example, at how many miles out from ground zero, pine needles will catch on fire. You know, upholstery in cars will explode into flames. And you say to yourself, my God, they've been calculating this. Why? Because there are plans in place to fight a nuclear war, which is unwinnable. One section which really stuck with me about that was what you said about nuclear armed submarines, describing them as the handmaidens of the apocalypse. Can you just explain why that is? First of all, they can deliver an amount of a load of weaponry that can absolutely take out a continent for example, right? The, the U.S. nuclear-armed, nuclear-powered submarines are unstoppable. They could stay st hidden in the ocean for, you know, day months at a time until they run out of food. 
The former commander of the nuclear sub-forces, Admiral Connor, whom I interviewed for the book, told me that it's easier to locate a grapefruit-sized object in space than it is to locate a submarine under the sea. They write, they cannot be stopped. And they lurk around in the oceans on alert, ready to launch. It takes about 14 minutes from the time a nuclear-armed submarine receives a launch order until those missiles fire. They're in place as what is called a second strike, meaning were a nuclear weapon to strike the continental United States from an ICBM, which is a land-launched ballistic missiles. The submarines essentially exist, and we're talking in theoretical policy, so that no one ever dares to use a nuclear weapon against the United States or against Russia. That's the concept behind deterrence, right? So again, you have this kind of, you know, standoff of don't you dare. It's known through the ages as mutual assured destruction. But again, what if that fails? What those handmaidens of the apocalypse can deliver, it truly gives you nightmares. I think the real nightmare aspect is there's a lot of uh, description as to what it would be like for the people um, left behind. You use a very powerful quote of uh, the survivors will envy the dead. So what, what kind of life and planet would those people be looking at? To report that part of the book, I had the great fortune of interviewing Professor Brian Toon, who was one of the original five authors of the nuclear winter theory. Carl Sagan is perhaps the most famous of those five authors. And Toon was Sagan's young student. And Professor Toon has spent all the decades since dedicated to this idea of nuclear winter and bringing it up to speed with climate modeling systems based on 21st century computer systems. The sun will likely be blotted out in the agriculture bearing areas of the globe, the mid latitudes for seven to 10 years. The earth will experience a temperature drop of as much as 40 degrees. Sorry, I don't have the Celsius, those are Fahrenheit. But what happens is large bodies of water are frozen under ice sheets for years at a time. Agriculture fails and people starve. Those people begin to fight for food and ultimately starve to death. Which brings us to that Nikita Khrushchev quote, the survivors will envy the dead. And he wrote that, by the way, in a letter to President Kennedy. And after the president's assassination, Jackie Kennedy wrote to Khrushchev, um, thanking him for his condolences and reminding him of that quote. You're obviously an expert in seeking out these interviews, but is it tricky to get people to talk about nuclear war when it's a real world scenario? And you know, at some point this information may have been privileged. Did you find it hard finding people that would be happy to speak to you for it? During COVID, when we had a former president named President Trump in office, you know, yelling and shouting about fire and fury and making some incredibly, what seemed to this reporter, like reckless threats um, against North Korea, a nuclear-armed nation with a rather unstable individual in charge of that nuclear arsenal. And I began to notice that some of the major players in the world of nuclear command and control were actually going on record with members of Congress. And if you wanted to nerd out on that like I did, you could see former STRATCOM commanders speaking about their concerns of this chain of command. And that's where it became obvious, I think, to a lot of people in the United States that the President of the United States has what's called sole launch authority. And what that means is he asks permission of no one to start a nuclear war. Not the Secretary of Defense, not the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and not Congress. So that sort of confluence of events, rhetoric, COVID, people perhaps in an interesting and unique place for the first time in their lives, I was able to reach out to some of my significant sources, former Secretaries of Defense, Um, A former STRATCOM commander spoke to me on the record. The former director of FEMA 
which is the federal emergency management agency that's in charge of the people after a nuclear war. I spoke to these people on the record and what they told me scared me and motivated me to write this book through to the end. And that's what I do. I take the reader from nuclear launch to nuclear winter. If there was one thing you wish that everyone could understand about nuclear war, what would it be? Very gifted people who have dedicated their lives to what's called non-proliferation, nuclear non-proliferation. But they're a small and tiny group considering how big the world is and how many people would be impacted during nuclear war. And in speaking to these individuals, they talk about their frustration that no one is really listening and that, for example, change really only happens, certainly in America, when the public cares. There was a television show in 1983 called The Day After. It was a fictional account of a nuclear war between the United States and Russia. I was a high school student at the time, and I saw it, and it shocked and horrified me. And guess who else saw it? President Ronald Reagan. And he wrote in his memoirs that he became depressed after watching it. And then he also explained that he, it caused him to reach out to Gorbachev. And together, they signed a treaty that reduced this insane arsenal of nuclear weapons, which at its high point was 70,000 nuclear weapons. And that has been reduced now to about 12,500. That's still arguably 12,500 too many. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say for my next question, I mean, what would you like to see in the future? But I guess that kind of tells us, I mean, what would you like to see happen next with nuclear weapons and the situation we're in at the moment? My job as a narrative storyteller, as a journalist, is to bring the facts to the people. And what I did in this book, which differs a little from my previous books, which are heavy histories of long programs, This book begins, you know, a few seconds from now, hypothetically. And it is entirely fact-based, meaning all of the scenarios inside of which that could happen are based on the science that is in place to happen. It aims to present an urgency to the reader so that they can quickly get to the end of the book and have a conversation about it. Because in conversation all great things come to pass. Just finally for our talk now, I wanted to know what's one thing that you hope that everyone will take away from reading it? People can perhaps take away their own misjudgment of a situation from not having a full set of facts. And what that is meant to do is not make anyone feel, you know, embarrassed for a lack of knowledge or even make anyone else feel self-righteous for knowing something. I really do believe that's the big problem right now. It's the lack of information that, to my eye, is always the most dangerous situation. Because when you learn about just how radical, how, how radically dangerous many of these nuclear systems are, And when you couple that with the idea that it's just a big system of systems and all systems fail, you have to ask yourself, maybe it's wise for me to know about this so that dot, dot, dot. Yeah, I think for anyone watching this who's kind of in that position of not knowing much and perhaps felt a bit intimidated by the topic, I would encourage you to read this because I think it's not an easy thing to write about in a way that anyone can understand, but you've absolutely done it. And um, I feel so much more informed on the topic now. And I think, as you say, that's such an important step for us to take. Uh, Thank you so much for your time today. It's been great to chat to you about it. Thank you so much for having me.